have fun. Hello and welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Ontario Network of CAPC CPMP Projects 2023 uh, Network Online Conference. And here we are at our final session for the day and for our time together. I'm really pleased to uh, welcome Krista Dobson, uh, who is joining us for a session called Financial Wellbeing. Uh, I've actually known Krista for uh, quite a few years. We are colleagues. We both work for Horizon Family and Community Services. So I'm, I've been aware of the good work that she does with, uh, with families around financial wellbeing. And I'm just I'm so glad to welcome you here. Uh, Krista. And uh, so I will hand it over to you. But as you know, I'm here for you if you need anything as we go forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I have my slides up, so I won't be able to see you. So just shout out to me if you need to, Sydney, and then mm -hmm. I'll let you know about the videos. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. And I, I appreciate you asking me to, to speak. Um, so as Sydney said, my name is Krista, and I'm lucky enough um, to say I really love my job as a financial counselor. Uh, even better, during my 29 years of working in financial counseling, I've been lucky enough to work um, all of that time at Cries and Family and Community Services. That being said, um, this isn't a career I ever saw myself doing, as I knew it existed, uh, which I or didn't know it existed, which I would hear a lot from my clients would say as well, but didn't know the service was available. Um, and as well, math was not my favorite subject um, in school, uh, but it turns out it doesn't have that much to do with um, math. So a lot of it has to do with our emotional and financial well-being, as you'll see um, as we as I go through the presentation. So when I said that I was lucky enough to have worked in a counseling agency for so many years, it's helped evolve how we look at um, uh, financial counseling now. Uh, and it's becoming more, what I'm going to talk about is becoming more um, popular as well, too. It's very popular in the States. They have um, um, financial psychologists, which is awesome. Um, so how we look at it now is it's not all just about that scary B word, which is budgeting, um, but also how we deal with the emotional piece that goes hand in hand when we're dealing with finances so we can be capable of being successful in dealing with our finances moving forward. When I started, we did a repayment plan as an option for debts for clients. And what I would find is we'd have a solution for uh, what the financial issue was. But and we do budgeting and, and go over that so people were aware of how to um, handle their finances and be successful with that. But I always say you could be the best budgeter in the world, but why are our finances not working? Um, we could do finances for a living, but why are my finances not working? And that is all the emotional piece that comes with it. Um, that years ago were not recognized. Uh, so what I had found when we did the repayment plan, people would be cycling um, maybe back in five years, 10 years in the same financial situation. Uh, so this way we can maybe help bring awareness um, of what's going on. It doesn't mean I can't do it. It's just what's happening um, with the emotional piece, not always with the financial piece, but they go hand in hand. Um, financial and emotional wellness is basically a balance between having a healthy state of mental, mental well-being um, today while preparing financially for tomorrow. It's not necessarily about being wealthy. Um, some stats on mental health and personal unsecured debt. So people in debt are more than three times as likely to experience mental health issues than people who are not in debt. Um, individuals with overwhelming financial issues are also at a greater risk for depression, alcohol dependency, drug dependency, um, psychotic issues and suicide um, completion than individuals who are free from financial stress. Um, conversely, certain mental health conditions may put a person at an increased risk for developing financial problems. So in particular, mental health conditions that affect a person's mood or behavior, such as depression, bipolar, or attention deficit, um, hyperactivity, have been linked with money management issues. About 31% of people living in poverty have been diagnosed with depression, compared with just 15% of those who do not live in poverty. The lower uh, a person's socioeconomical status, the more um, his or her risk 
of experience in mental health issues, mental health issues, sorry, increases um, overall finances and financial stress in mental health are interconnected. So all that being said, I'd like to start with um, a mindfulness activity. And the mindfulness activity, um, well, actually, I'll pause for a second. So topics that will be covered today, as you can kind of tell, is recognizing, understanding the connection between emotions and finances. We'll talk about goals and financial, val or financial goals and values, emotional spending triggers, financial well-being, um, debt management options, um, and resources and some questions. So um, the mindfulness exercise is actually um, to do with self-compassion, which we'll talk a little bit about in group. So if we're okay, just taking a moment to pause and practice self-compassion. So especially when you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, we do this in our groups at the start of group. Um, we can use this when we're doing our finances, uh, breathe any mindfulness activity maybe that we've practiced um, will help just even breathing exercises. And we'll, as we go along, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, if you can reach up and touch your heart or give yourself a hug, um, if you're comfortable with that, take a few deep breaths. As you're breathing, acknowledge that you may be in a difficult situation and see if you can treat yourself with as much kindness as you would a dear friend or child who's struggling. Often yourself um, phrases are of compassion first by acknowledging the situation. So acknowledging this is a difficult situation for me right now. Difficulties are part of being human and keep breathing. May I remember to treat myself with love and kindness. And take a few more deep breaths. And then come back. So the other thing I do when I do groups to kind of help us get focused, um, have the right mindset to move forward with what we're working on is I also use financial affirmations. Sometimes mindfulness exercises are not as helpful with everyone. Um, so some people connect more with financial affirmations. The one I picked, um, we do several when I do groups, but and our groups are, are six weeks long. So this information I'm giving to you is kind of like a little snapshot um, of of, you know, the bigger picture of how we can expand on um, our emotional well-being when we're doing finances. So the financial affirmation I pick for, day, for today is it's not selfish to take good care of myself financially. It's self-respecting and self-caring. So I'll read that one more time. It's, it is not selfish to take good care of myself financially. It's self-respecting and self-caring. So I'm just going to ask if Sydney could play um, the video. Um, I know uh, Kristen Neff was at one of your um, conferences not too long ago, and I really enjoy her, um, her work that she does. So I thought this might be a fitting video to play at this session. So Sid, if you get a chance, you please go ahead and play the video. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, Thank you. So if I could have you stop sharing for a moment and then I'll be able to, uh, yeah, of course. to take over yep. and uh, share the video. I am, yes, a huge, huge fan. So here, let bear with me as I do this. Uh, share sound and push the screen. So how do I define um, self-compassion then? I really don't see a difference between compassion for self and others. I define them exact, the exact same way. I argue that self-compassion has the components of a sense of kindness, kindness, care, uh, understanding for yourself versus judgment, a sense of common humanity versus feeling isolated and cut off from others, 
Um, and then a sense of mindfulness, right? being aware of the suffering that's occurring versus over-identification, which, again, I'll just clarify this in one moment. Let's go through each one separately. Okay, so self-kindness versus self-judgment. Kindness is more than just um, hearts and flowers, okay? Kindness has a very active um, component to it. It means when you're kind to yourself, you really want to comfort yourself when you're suffering. You want to alleviate your suffering. You want to soothe yourself. Okay, it's a, it's a very active um, stance where I want to do whatever I can to help myself feel as good as possible in this moment. Okay. Common humanity, um, really framing one's own experience in light of the common human experience. It's very funny, if I were to ask any of you, you know, are you a human being? Are you a human being? Yes, of course. Is everyone else a human being? Yes, of course. Does everyone else suffer? Yes, of course. You would say that logically. But in the moment when you just blew it at work, or you had someone reject you, or something really bad happens in your life, what happens non-rationally is that we get very egocentric. We feel like, why me? This is somehow has happened to me. I'm the only one who's messed up. I'm the only one who's going through that difficult time. And we feel really cut off from others. It's as if somehow when things go wrong, that's abnormal. You know, this is not supposed to be this way. Something has gone wrong. But, you know, is that the case? Has anything gone wrong? Is anything abnormal? No. <laughs> you know, that's what life is. Life goes wrong. No one in here signed a contract before you got, you know, born in this world saying, I would be perfect, my life would be perfect. And yet it's like, this is not the plan I signed up for. I'm pissed off about it, right? That's how we, that's how we react. Um, the problem with that, and there's a lot of problems with that, but one of the main things is when we feel isolated and cut off from others, you know, physiologically, that's very frightening. If, if you think evolutionary, what, evolutionarily, one of the worst things that can happen to us is to be isolated from the group, because then we aren't safe. Um, and it's interesting, this aspect of well-being, I don't think has been studied enough. This sense of can we feel connected to others in our suffering, or do we feel isolated from others in our suffering? And just, I can tell you, in the workshops I've conducted, especially the eight-week ones, at the end, I ask people what they got out of this the most, almost every single person says common humanity. I realize it's not just me. It's not just me who judges myself. It's not just me who suffers like this. Very important to remember that this is the human experience. This is how things are supposed to be. Okay, there's nothing has gone wrong. Yes, it's painful, but it's normal. It's natural. And then this is where the mindfulness comes in. Um, you have to be aware of your suffering in order to give it compassion. So um, mindfulness allows you not only to notice your suffering, but very important, and we'll talk about this more, to be with your suffering as it is. We don't like to be around suffering. If we could just get rid of pain, you know, we'd do it. Um, and we have lots of psychological mechanisms to avoid that, again, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. So self-compassion says, wow, pain is occurring. Can I turn toward that? Can I be with that? And you actually need to do that to be able to give yourself the caring and support you need. All right. Now, some people do say, come on, you have to notice your suffering. Isn't it like blindingly obvious I'm suffering? But it's often really not. Um, the pain caused by self-judgment, I think in some ways that's some of the worst pain all of us experience. You know, constant, niggly, niggly pain. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not this enough. I blew it. I'm this, I'm that. But often we are so lost in the role of self-critic that we don't really stop to realize, oh my God, this is really, really hurting. You know? And in some ways it feels more comfortable to be the self-critic because at least the self-critic isn't the person that messed up. <laughs> you know, the self-critic knows you messed up. The, the part of you that feels really you know, vulnerable and secure and a failure. Um, often we don't give that sort of side of the um, process as much attention, okay? And then also very um, important when things go wrong in our lives, very often we go straight into problem-solving mode. It's like, there's a problem. I don't want there to be a problem. I need to fix the problem, you know, immediately. Um, and what happens is we go straight into problem-solving mode and don't stop to, again, turn towards the suffering and say, whew, 
this is really hard, this is difficult, I need a little, I need a little care and compassion to get me through this, then we, aren't, we really aren't at our best and our most psychologically stable when we go um, towards trying to fix that problem. Okay, so it's actually something you have to remind yourself to do before going straight into fixing problems. To just acknowledge and validate how difficult the situation is. Thank you, Sydney, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So Kristen touches on a lot of really interesting points when we're dealing with financial situations. The last point um, being really important is taking the time to recognize our suffering, what we're going through, um, which is very important. We will do that with things like if we're um, having marital struggles, um, it, and it's very common to understand and realize that this is difficult. I need to take some time. I need to reach out for help, maybe look at what the best solutions are to help me move forward. When we deal with finances, it feels like, oh, I messed up. I hear a lot of times I, I really messed up when I was young. Now I'm paying for those mistakes that I made and using all those negative words. Um, and those are learning experiences. If we didn't learn these in school or as we were growing up, they are learning experiences as we move forward. So just to take the time to realize that um, this is suffering, um, I do need to take some time for myself. I also need to reach out and look what might be good solutions, um, how I can best help um, moving forward. So uh, that is a really key piece that she talked about. She talked about um, self-kindness and self-judgment. That help happens a lot. Um, again, with those negative words that we use, how we feel that we've handled the situation. Um, self-kindness versus self-judgment as well. Um, common humanity versus isolation. So with the isolation piece as well, we do feel like we're the only ones um, that others aren't experiencing this. Although there were some things that came out of the pandemic, what we're feeling with the economic society that we're in right now is that we know we're not alone and it can make it a little bit easier to talk to people about this because it is something that's more common. Um, more people are uh, feeling this, these ways with what's happening in the economy right now. Uh, they may not feel like good things, but being able to talk about this is really important. And I always encourage people if they're comfortable enough to reach out for help to talk about these things. Um, and part of the problem as well, too, um, we're going to go into um, uh, consumerism, uh, goals and values. But another thing to remember is that we're bombarded with advertising every day, so which affects what we value um, and can negatively impact our self-esteem. So if we believe that we are not living up to standard of others, um, in other words, the parameters of self-esteem are largely defined for us. So however self-compassion um, is, is self-compassion sorry is like being a good friend to ourselves and never saying anything to ourselves that we would not say to our best friend which I think is kind of key to try and remember um, we might be in blame mode for ourselves but if a friend came to us in the same situation we wouldn't say yeah you're right you did a terrible thing when you were young you should never have done that why did you do that no we would say you didn't know right how, how would you have known this it is a learning experience it's how can I help you those kind of things so that's kind of a key thing when we're dealing um, with, with finances is how we um, have that self-talk in our head as well, too. Um, I'm just going to, don't necessarily have to bring up the slide because I'll have to stop sharing again. Um, but Sydney, the next video that, um, if you're able to play for me, would be fabulous. It's the um, step one for financial well-being, uh, financial, or the values and financial goals. Um, it's the next video link there, if you can see it. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, do you, the the one that's value focused versus goal focused life. Okay, let me. Do you want me to play that now? Yes, exactly. Okay, let me cue that. If up. you could, that'd be fabulous. Okay. I just wanted to forward through the little ad at the beginning. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, I think, okay. We're... House, have a nice car, have holidays. Goal, 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 goal. And 
It's true that if you do actually manage to achieve these goals, then there is a little moment of joy and happiness. But how long does it last? How long before you're looking at the next goal, and then the next goal, and then the next goal? And as we live our life trying to constantly strive to achieve these goals, one after the other after the other, how tiring and exhausting does it get? Is this you? There is a radically different way to live your life, which is a life based on values, a values-focused life. It's like two kids in the back of a car, and it's a three-hour car journey to Disneyland. And the first kid is totally goal-focused. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How much longer? Are we there yet? This journey of frustration, it's all about the goal. The second kid is values focused. He's got the same goal. He wants to get to Disneyland, but he's also in touch with his values around curiosity, adventure, having fun. So he's looking out of the window, playing I Spy with My Little Eye. He's counting all the, you know, the interesting farmhouses that he sees on the way. He's spotting interesting farm animals, cows and sheep. He's noticing different types of trucks and cars on the freeway. So he's actually appreciating the journey as he heads towards his goal. Now, they both reach Disneyland at the same time. They both have a fantastic time at Disneyland because they both got to achieve the goal. But the first kid had a journey of frustration. The second kid had a fulfilling, rewarding journey. Then on the way home, the first kid, are we home yet? Are we home yet? Are we home yet? All about the goal, all that frustration. Second kid's looking out of the window, noticing how the world looks different at night, spotting the, the lights in the farmhouses and the cat's eyes on the freeway. The car breaks down on the way to Disneyland. Now, both kids are really disappointed because neither of them achieved their goal. But the second kid at least had a fulfilling journey up until that point. Now, when the pickup truck arrives to tow them home, the first kid, Oh, it's not fair! I want to go to Disneyland! How long before the car gets repaired? It's not fair! It's not fair! The second kid starts to notice how the world looks different when you're sitting in the front of a pickup truck high above the level of the rest of the traffic. So this is the very important distinction between the values-focused life and the goal-focused life. In the values-focused life, we have the fulfillment and satisfaction of living our values every step of the way towards our goals, the satisfaction of achieving our goals, and the fulfillment that comes of living our values even when we don't achieve our goals. There you go. Thank you, Sydney. You're welcome. Thank you. So I'm just going to share screen again. Oh, Krista, are there other videos? Do you, are there others? I have one. I do have one more, but it'll be coming up, not right away. So okay. I have a little bit more information and then I'll have one more video. <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'll look for it. No problem. Perfect. Okay. It's consumerism, if that helps you. So that video um, on values and goals, I really like that one. I use that for youth and for adults because our, our values are something that we're not used to using when um, we look at our finances. It's becoming more popular to do, but that hasn't been um, so for a while. And most uh, financial workshops you look at don't look at the values. So values um, in our everyday life when we're making financial decision, on, number one on the slide, it says values make sure that whatever daily, weekly, monthly, moment to moment choice um, and choices we're relating to our financial goals um, in this workshop, fit into what you um, envision to be your personal values in life. So personal values, there's so many values to pick from and they're what are important to you. There's no wrong answer to what um, values are important to you. So 
Some could be creativity, um, spirituality, persistence, a family, a safe place to live, education. Uh, so those are a few just to give us an idea of what we're looking at for the values when we're relating it um, to finances. But again, our values would be related in everyday life. It's not specific to finances. They're what's important to us for values. Um, so um, that even if you don't reach the goal um, that we we're looking for, or you do reach the goal, you find yourself feeling fulfilled because your actions are in line with um, positive image or you see yourself. So in the video, um, we're not trying to get to one goal, to another goal, or the one child is trying to get to that main goal and not looking at what's going on um, around him. It takes time to get to our financial goals. So we don't want to be so fo focused that, oh, this is going to take forever. Um, this is my main goal. And then when we get to the goal, um, we want to enjoy that goal as well. It has some meaning to us because we strive so long for it, um, as opposed to going from goal, 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 goal. Uh, we never get enjoyment out of it. Um, and, and that's something that our values can help us with. So if this is important to us, if it's in line with our value, we will appreciate it. We understand that it will take time to get to in some cases. And when we get to it, we will um, appreciate that. Um, two says figuring out your values involve asking yourself what sort of person do you want to be? If you're stuck on your values or maybe haven't looked at what your values are um, for yourself, um, it, sometimes it can take a while to tourism comes into that because sometimes our values could we could think that our values are one thing because other people are doing this, but it's truly what's important to you. Um, what makes you the person you want to be or would like to be? Uh, so what personal strengths and qualities um, do you want to develop? Um, so that's step one when we look at um, financial wellness, or if I look at um, budgeting, I try not to use um, budgeting as much, um, the wording, but um, it is something that is in everyday life and we're still using that word. So, but when I talk about um, financial wellness, when I started this, I was told there's 10 steps to budgeting. And I thought, wow, if I have to go over 10 steps, that's a lot. And I don't know if I'd even want to sit and listen to all those 10 steps and, and not alone just have to be able to do them. If you can stick to the first three steps, which the first one is financial goals, and I kind of stick financial goals and values together. Um, and I will go through the other two, but starting with financial goals are very important because those are the things that are going to give us incentive to move forward, to be able to help us with our finances, to give us that incentive to, okay, this is why I'm not getting two cups of coffee today. I'm getting one cup of coffee today because this goal is important to me. So if goals are important enough to us, um, they can help us also stick to um, our finances as, as we've kind of laid them out. Um, so at the top, it says good money management involves setting goals which provide direction, motivation, and actionable steps. Creating specific goals can encourage you to balance your spending and savings. So that's kind of the key thing, giving us that incentive, giving us a plan to move forward when they use the actionable steps. Um, um, some of you might have used smart um, steps as far as reaching uh, goals in life. And that's basically having that plan. And as I go through um, starting with the goals, it, it might make sense on how smart goals come into play. Also with the slides that I have, I'm fine sharing them with anybody who wants them. So I know it's kind of, they're small. Um, when I go into the slideshow, sometimes it messes up. So I didn't want to cause any more grief. Um, in, in this. So if somebody does want the slides, um, they can either reach out to me if, if, or go through Sydney and, and she can give you uh, my email if you like the slides or I can, uh, Sydney also has them so she can share them as well um, if you would like them. Um, so with the financial goals, the easiest way to do this, I say either pull out your phone and in your notes section, write out all of the goals that you would have. Um, sometimes it takes a while to figure out what our goals are because um, our financial goals, they could be something that, you know, I just don't feel I could attain it. So I've pushed it so far back in my head. And now I'm asking you to pull them all out, kind of take those stresses. Sometimes they're stresses because there can be a lot of them. Maybe my fridge um, is dying and I need a new fridge. I need new inner tires. I can get through with the ones I have this year, but I'll need them next year. So there's so many things and they can feel overwhelming. 
So pulling them out of our head, either writing them down on a big white sheet of paper, putting them in our phone, however we like to work, wherever we're going to look at them again. Um, so it can take a month sometimes to pull all of those out, uh, which is okay. Financial goals are something that we need to revisit. Just because I do my financial goals now doesn't mean they're, sit and they're set and they're never going to change. So looking at our financial goals uh, regularly and reviewing them are good as well too. So basically the slide says write down um, one to three financial goals in each of the following categories. But I want you to write down on the big sheet of paper all of your financial goals and then once we have all of those listed we're going to categorize them so we're going to do short term generally when we look at short term um, we look at one year um, medium term goals would be um, obtainable in five years long term goals uh, uh, five to 15 years you can change those timelines if you like just being realistic so part of the smart goals is r is realistic is this reachable for me to do in um um, one year or could I actually do this in, in six months so figuring out that plan goes along with when do I think I would be able to reach these goals if you're writing these goals down um, with your timelines for short term medium term long term if you're doing them on your phone that's great that's easy to change them pencil and paper easy enough to change them um, because as life happens uh, things that happen in life can change what our goals are. It doesn't mean we haven't reached our goals. Maybe they're not as important. We don't need them anymore or we've bumped them down. So maybe something I had a short term goal for, um, something's changed in life and now it um, makes more sense for me to do that medium term. So within five years. Um, so once we've determined what our financial goals are, how long um, uh, we've determined how long it will take us to reach um, that goal. Uh, then we're developing the plan for achieving um, each of our goals and how much um, do I have to save each week, each month to get to that goal. Um, and the bottom piece says, be sure to reconsider your goals periodically as changes in your life can impact your goals. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. One um, thing I normally use for financial goals or try to add in uh, to be a financial goal for people is an emergency savings. And that might feel like it's daunting to do. I know a lot of times when people um, look at savings in general, they basically say, you know, if I can't put $50 into my savings account uh, each month, what's the point? Because it's not going to add up to anything. It's not going to help me if an emergency actually does hit. And understandable. However, savings is something I find is really hard for people to do. Um, it, it takes time to develop that um, uh, that habit of savings. And if we haven't done it before, yeah, it definitely can seem daunting. So in there, I'm going to talk about different ways to have an emergency savings. There's a non-monetary emergency savings or savings change, or yeah, there's saving our funds um, in a bank account as well too. So if I look at the habit of creating savings, which I find is the hardest people, some, hardest part for people sometimes, is I use a pop bottle. And I did this myself. This is my money that I saved. So this is a big two liter pop bottle. It goes around with me to groups, so it's beaten up a little bit. Um, but basically how it works, when I started, I had um, 60 cents in dimes. And this sheet on it says that if you can fill this bottle up with dimes, you'll have $700 worth of dimes. Well, when I had 60 cents, I thought, oh, this is going to take forever. This isn't going to be helpful to anyone. If I can't do this, how am I expecting um, that others would possibly be able to do this as well? However, over time, once I started seeing it grow, which is why I used the clear bottle, um, I started seeing it grow and getting more and more dimes in there. I had the incentive to save. So that was helping um, promote me to save. I kept the bottle by the doorway when I came in. All my change came out, went into the bottle. I went through my partner's wallet, took his dimes um, and nickels as well. Um, and he didn't really like that. But you know what? This is more important. So um, this one, if you can fill a water bottle, this is a little bigger than a water bottle. So with nickels, five cents, if you can fill this um, with nickels, you'll have in a water bottle almost $30. And there's $10 in this one right now. There's $50 in this one, which I like because it doesn't look like it's $50. I have two sets of these. So I have $120 in dimes and nickels. 
Now that might not seem like a lot of money if an emergency hits. However, I've been doing this long enough to know that if something happens in my budget, um, you know, I have to pay my rent, my hydro, my utilities. If I don't, I'm going to be in a worse situation. Two weeks, hydro is going to be sending me a, uh, a slip saying, you know, we're cutting your hydro off. So um, I have to pay those things. Even if I don't and I double next month, you know, I still have to come up with those amounts. So the second highest expense in our budget, especially right now, is groceries. So if I spend my grocery money on whatever the emergency was, maybe I ended up needing my winter tires now and it didn't make it didn't make it till next year um, and I use my grocery money. Well, I have one hundred and twenty dollars in dimes and nickels that, you know what, I won't be eating the way I normally do this month. Um, it'll be like soups, craft dinner, um, peanut butter, bread, that kind of thing. Whatever I can make that will stretch for the month. That doesn't cost a lot until next month when I have my regular food budget. Um, so that is one way that that can help to start giving us a savings. Some people um, don't use cash and just debit. There are accounts available. I know Scotia has one and there are other banks that do. I think Scotia was the first one a long time ago that came up with the rounding up. Um, so say I spent uh, $10.50 they would make the purchase look as $11 and that 50 cents then would go into a savings account. So that's a way of um, doing the same kind of savings with change. I just do say be mindful of how often that happens. So it might take a little bit of practice in the beginning because change is important um, in our budget depending on how much we're spending as well. So seeing how that goes in the beginning and if we're too tight, maybe there's a um, not regularly, but say end of the month that needs to be put back into our budget, but still keeping some savings in there. So there's also a non-monetary emergency savings and the non-monetary emergency savings is um, basically can we buy um, non-perishable food items that we'll keep and we have enough for a month's food supply. So if we can't save change each time we go to the grocery store, could we buy one non-perishable food item that if an emergency hits and if we do happen to use in our grocery budget, we still have food that we can use. So between the non-monetary emergency savings, the savings of change. A lot of times I find that um, participants that I work with already have a savings, an emergency savings started, which is great, um, and feel a little bit better about that because that can be a stressor when we don't have a savings. What do we do if something happens and I need the funds for it and my budget is too tight to come up with those funds. Um, the other thing with the pop bottle savings is it's a great visual to have for us for incentive to remember to save life is busy um, so it, we don't always remember these things uh, so the other thing with the visual if we have kids a great way to start them um, to learn to save as well too and that can kind of work out for us for the better if they see that our habits are saving for items that we need that's also creating that habit for them when they're younger um, so if, if they come to us and say hey, I want this new video game that came out, um, instead of having to say no and like, giving the long lecture as to why we can't get these things just when we want them, it's like we can say yes, okay, great, we can get it. However, I'm gonna save half, you save half, once we come up with the money for it, then we can go get it. And we're kind of teaching them needs and wants at the same time. They're not the same needs and wants as we have as adults, but um, this is important to them at the time. So maybe it's taken them a month, month and a half to save for that video game. And at the time, a new one has just come out. Um, then they have to kind of deduct, well, do I want the old one or do I want the new one? So it's kind of teaching them how to see, you know, the importance of pieces, sort of those needs and wants um, for, for younger um, kids. We can also decorate the bottle, uh, put on the video game we want. We can decorate it for ourselves as well too. Maybe it's for vacation. I have a lot of people who um, would save change for vacation as well too. So whatever that incentive that's going to motivate us as far as a visual, I find visuals when we're um, working with finances, um, starting new habits are really important to help keep us on track, to help build um, that habit and uh, give us that incentive to move forward. Um, so when we talk about financial goals, that's all well and good that we have um, um, our financial goals listed out. We have um, 
uh, we know what they are, the timelines for them, but then it's coming up with that plan. Well, how am I getting to get the money for it? Because right now, my budget just balances, or maybe my financial goal for the first year is going to be, uh, I need my budget to balance, so how do I do that? So the second step in um, their three steps would be uh, tracking your spending. It doesn't mean we have to track everything. Uh, some things we probably already know, like rent, hydro, utilities, those come with bills every month. They generally can be about the same amount. Uh, so those are our fixed expenses that normally we have an idea what those are. When I do a budget up with people, um, the places that I get guesstimates for would be, okay, how much do you spend on gas or eating out or groceries? Those are the kind of things that we're not sure. And when we guess at those amounts, we normally guess lower. Um, so those are the, typically the ones that I have people track. There's different ways to track, and I'll go over that. Um, but uh, so different ways to track, and I'll just show um, uh, one of the more, one of the visuals that I use for tracking. Um, bear with me here. I use the emotional spending tracker and I use the emotional spending tracker because just as I said, it has emotions attached to it. So it's also going to help us figure out why are we spending on certain things. Um, so if we're looking at maybe groceries or eating out or gas for the vehicle, I'm just going to use this visual example for how the spending tracker or tracking your um, spending for the month would look. So the spending tracker has every day of the week, it says uh, cost. So how much should it cost whatever we spent on um, what was the item we spent on and then how are we feeling when we spent the money um, so there's a key word that we're going to be looking for um, and that would be whatever is something that will stick out for you is this a need or a want when we're spending um, waiting for a purchase, if we're ordering online, you know, before we hit that um, checkout, you know, how are we feeling when we're spending the money? Is this something that we were planning on? Did we have it in our budget um, that we were going to even go out and get today? Or did I have um, a meal already prepared for today if it's eating out, something like that? Or are there 10 extra items in my cart? How come? It could just be that I'm hungry. Um, so really important to ask yourself that question. And if you can track for a month, then that's very helpful. It gives us a picture of what our monthly spending is. It won't be exact. Um, spending uh, from month to month can be different. Maybe groceries, I add in my groceries, um, maybe toiletries, shampoos, deodorants. Don't normally need those every month. Um, so that spending on groceries that month could be bigger than the last two months. And I could be trying to figure out why is it so expensive? If I've kept my receipts and maybe that's how I'm tracking, um, then I can look back at those receipts and see, oh, okay, so I did need shampoos, deodorants, but I don't normally need those every month. So it also gives us an understanding of what we're spending on as well. Um, but key in this kind of spending tracker for today is we're looking at what are the costs so we could stick them into our budget. Um, so if I find that um, I've, I do a lot of eating out and I'm really getting groceries and planning those meals as well, I'm kind of wasting money there. So is there a way that I could compromise? Um, but also why am I eating out so much? Is it because I'm just so overwhelmed at work and I'm stressed out and I just don't have time um, to make a meal at the end of the day? Um, maybe I have something else going on in my life that's contributing to I'm exhausted, maybe I'm feeling a little depressed, and I just don't have the motivation um, to do that meal planning and prepping the meal then when I get home, best intentions, but for right now is what's happening, I just can't do it. So having this awareness with our spending is very helpful as well. Understanding that there are other things that are going on in our life at the time as that's affecting our spending. So this way we can have a good visual of it. Um, you can use, um, uh, your bank uh, statement or credit card statement, however you make those purchases to kind of help with the tracking if we don't have a lot of time to do it as well. Uh, in the beginning, when we're starting uh, looking at our finances, it's that initial work that we're putting in for tracking, looking at our goals and evaluating our spending, that takes a bit of time. But once we set it up, it will be easier to do. Um, and we also need that understanding of what else is happening in our life um, that's affecting our spending. So the other piece why um, we look at spending is kind of like I said, we need to balance our budget. So if I look at maybe, um, so 
sorry, just stop sharing. If I look at, um, you know, I'm eating out or I'm getting coffees every day. So what I look at is if I saw in my spending tracker, I'm getting two coffees a day every day of the week. Well, okay, I didn't realize I was doing that. And then when I added it up, how much it cost. Okay, this is going to be the key how we can kind of maybe cut back in certain areas, but understanding what we're spending on, how much we're spending on. And then once we have that information, if I want to be able to obtain my goals, but I don't have money left over, or I want to balance my budget, what things can I cut back on? And I don't say cut out of our budget, but cut back on. And it doesn't mean we have to cut back on forever, or maybe we do cut something out, but it's for six months, and then we can put it back in um, so we can reach that goal that we have. So one thing I look at is if I am getting two coffees a day, um, so this is something that we did as a family. So if I'm getting two coffees a day and it's $1.60 for the coffee, visually that doesn't look like a lot it's change um, but if I do that two times a day now it's increased to three dollars and twenty cents again visually okay I use loonies or toonies it's not a lot of money um, for two coffees a day but I'm going to using my um, emotional spending tracker I'm going to add that up and for seven days of the week now it costs me twenty two dollars and forty cents for a week of coffee so two coffees um, a day for one week I'm not done yet. So if I do that for the month, so times four, I'm spending $89.60 on two coffees a day for the month. So that's almost $100. When I look at it as $100, that has more impact on me. So this is where visuals are really important when we're looking at our finances as opposed to doing our budget in our head. That doesn't have as much of an impact or kind of doing the calculations in our head unless we visually see it. Still not done. I'm going to see how much I'm spending for the year on two coffees a day. So I'm actually spending $1,075.20 on two coffees a day every day of the year. So it doesn't mean like if it fits in my budget and that's what I want, that's totally fine. We're not saying you can't spend on those things. But if we're looking at places where we want to cut back to achieve those financial goals, because those goals um, are important enough to us, I can cut back and just get one coffee a day. I don't think that um, for me, it wasn't the end of the world. Uh, but for others, it might be. So maybe we look elsewhere. But if I divide that by two and I only got one coffee a day for the year, then I'm spending $537.60, but I'm also saving that. So at the end of the year, I could have a savings of $537.60 to go towards whatever my financial goal is. Um, so having, you know, just a small amount, looking at the $1.60 in the beginning, it didn't seem like a lot. But if I do it for the year and then um, I just cut back by one, that can be a good amount that I could have um, at the end of the year for whatever my financial financial goal is. So when I'm looking at tracking for the month, I know it sounds like a lot of work. However, it can be the reward to balancing our budget. It could be that emergency savings that I wanted to start or um, my winter tires that would be very helpful and obtainable. Uh, so when we're coming up with that plan of, of what would be feasible to cut back so we can make those financial goals work, that's kind of the idea. Some people will track their, um, I say track it for one month, trying to make it as, as you know, um, not as difficult as possible, but to get that information, because that's key. Some people find that once they start tracking, they're more honest with their spending. Um, they have that visual of, okay, what happened um, last month and this month? And we can kind of see what that is. They're also account accountable to how they're feeling when they're spending the money as well too. So those can be good things that can help keep us on track and uh, again a new habit that we're looking at being accountable for our spending also being mindful of how we're feeling when we're spending money so these are not things that when I'm really busy I'm going to remember so maybe I put a little sticky on my debit card or on my cash or some some way that I'm going to remember this or I fold up this spending tracker um, that I have and I stick that um, in with my debit card so I'm mindful of asking myself how am I feeling um, remembering to track um, my spending, those kind of things. So the third step is um, uh, 
uh, evaluating where you spend your money. So when we're evaluating where we spend our money, that's kind of what I said is that, okay, I know my financial goals. I've tracked my spending. I've added them into my budget for my groceries, my gas, my eating out. So now I have a pretty complete budget. Maybe I looked at, okay, haircuts. I get that once every three months. So I'm adding all those things in from the pieces that I've tracked or I've gone through my bank statement. I have some people who want to do their projection of the year because there are things that can happen annually and they want to get a really good picture of what they're spending for the year is so they can also plan. So they go back through their bank statements. So this works really well if we use debit. If we have any cash withdrawals, those are the pieces that can be a little harder. And I say, can you keep receipts for those? Just again, if we're doing that for one month, but using bank statements, credit card statements to help look at our, um, our uh, spending if we want to do that for the year. But I, again, I try to make this simple when we're starting out. Can we just start moving forward um, and do it one month at a time? So the step three is evaluating where you spend your money. So it's basically what we did with the spending tracker. We look back see where we're spending. Is there somewhere I could cut back a little bit either to balance our budget or to stay on track or to achieve those financial goals? So if we do the three steps to budgeting, our financial goals and values, uh, tracking our spending, and then also evaluating where we spend our money, we will be on track with our budget. Step five always stuck out to me in the 10 steps, and step five is not spending more than you make. Well, if we are tracking our spending, evaluating our spending, we, will, we won't be spending more than we make because we are looking very in-depth at what we are spending. Um, so those are the key three key steps. If we stay on track with those, um, that should help us move forward with our budget. Remember, life happens. Um, um, this is going to be new in some cases to look at how we're feeling when we're spending money as well too. So we will stumble from time to time, but if we set these good habits in place, we can get back on track a lot faster. We're not relearning these things over again. So that's another positive thing that comes with creating these good habits with our finances. Um, however, there are roadblocks that can happen that are out of our control that we're bombarded with, as I talked about with consumerism. So this is my heads up for you, Sid, if you're okay playing the consumerism video. Um, and then, then I'll go over that as how that affects our spending. Yes, absolutely. I think I've got it here. Thanks so much. It's the uh, automatic thoughts. Is that the one? Okay. No, sorry. Um, yeah, I can tell you what side it's on. So under the spending tracker, um, emotional spending triggers. Do you know what number slide that is? Uh, okay. Um, so it's it's number eight. On slide eight? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Yeah. One second. Okay. Thanks. Advertising is everywhere. And what you read, what you watch, what you eat, what you wear, they're in the sky, they're on the ground, they're in the water. Our economy thrives on you buying more and more and more, even though you don't need any more. And oh yeah, you're in debt. The goal of advertising is simple, get you to buy a product, to make you say yes, I want this, I need this, my life will be better with this retro cowbell dispenser but a mason jar too that is adorable this is the mug that won't fall over watch this it fell it fell we wanted to learn how advertisers capture our attention and get us to buy stuff we don't even really need so we turned to Jonas Sachs an advertising executive and co-founder of free range studios to explain a few ways brands get into our heads how do ads tell us who we are or give us tell us who we should be we see 3,500 of them a day and the majority of them basically tell us, you suck, and if you don't buy this product, you're not gonna be rich enough, smart enough, hot enough, and so we walk around being told 3,500 times a day how deficient and lame we are. Are there any ads that have stuck out in your mind? The number one most shared 
advertisement on YouTube of all time is that Dove Real Beauty Sketches ad. Mm -hmm. They make the Real Beauty Sketches, it's all about how women are so much more beautiful than they think they are through this stunt of the police artist who's sketching them. Tell me about your hair. They make a picture of what they think they look like versus what a stranger thinks. Kind of have a fat, rounder face. People are saying, listen, they're reaching hundreds of millions of people with a positive message about beauty. People want to share it because they say, oh, those are my values, that's my idea. And then you start buying the soap because you share those values. So this is one of those classic shop therapy ads. The, you know, parenthood is hard, drinking Coke is easy. You need to speak to people on the level of identity, you need to speak to people on the level of emotion. There are millions of people who are gonna sit there and be like, yeah, that's my truth, that's it, it's totally me. Thanks, Coke. Why use Beckham? Advertisements tell you not that this product does this thing, it's that people like this use this product. If you want to be like these kind of people, use this product and you're instantly one of them. So, you know, we all want heroes in our lives and we want to know how to be more like those heroes. And, um, you know, watching sports and watching movies that these guys are in, we don't necessarily know how to be more like them, but advertisements tell us how to be. Are you up for whatever? Don't answer. Grab a Bud Light and show it. Try new things. Make new friends. I mean, it's all just crafted around creating a gap. You know, you don't have enough, you don't have what's right. It's not necessarily even that the audiences are sitting at home and saying, oh man, I, I need to spend more time in the club. It's like saying, they're saying everybody else is in the club, and why aren't you there? So advertising is just a constant fear of missing out. There's a huge amount of that. Wow, advertisers are like crappy friends. They make us feel needy, ugly, and uncool, but we keep them around anyway. This is a beautiful moment. Sure could use a Coke. So as we can see in the video with consumerism, there's other things in life that can help us um, feel like we need to spend money. Um, when I looked up definition for consumerism, it says it's a social and economic um, the acquisition of goods and services in ever increasing amounts, um, which is kind of important because we do find that those things are mounting of the pressures of things that we need. Um, maybe we see our neighbors have like a nice fancy house, a big car, um, and they must be doing well. It doesn't mean that they're doing well uh, visually. That's what we see, but we don't know that everything is financed um, and that things are difficult. Um, so that is something with consumerism where uh, this is a big one for me um, where I know that you know advertisement agencies spend um, millions of dollars on figuring out what can get us to spend money um, and they use the psychological tools um, that will give the triggers for us to spend money so uh, simple examples of that would be the grocery store um, you know, they play nice, gentle music, calming music to keep us in there. They um, put the fruits and vegetables on one end, the dairy products on the other. So you have to walk through the full store um, and see all the other products that are available. There are certain bins that we know that there's areas that um, um, that are, have the sale items. Maybe we've looked at the flyers already and we've gone through our cupboards and we know uh, what it is that we need. Um, but, you know, we just gravitate over there to see what's there. And it's like, oh, that visual, again, key is visual of um, wanting to um, save money as well too. That's something that's impressed upon us. So if we just gravitate over there and they're everyday items that we would generally use. Um, so it could be if we have kids, they're drinking boxes. Um, it could be a meat product um, that we would, most people would generally buy. Even the um, tags, uh, ticket tags in the store, so a good deal we know is normally a red tag. So we gravitate to the red color um, where they put the items in the grocery store are important. So eye level are generally the most expensive name brand products. We'd have to look up or down um, for the lower priced similar product. They also change the stores around um, where they put the items a lot of times. So we have to search and searching. We're looking through all those other options of things like, oh, I never saw that before. That would be good to try. Um, 
so I'm just going to also share on the screen, though I'm kind of going through some of this quick because I want to have enough time to get to some of the key points. Um, but one of the ones I wanted to share um, is on some uh, saving strategies. I want to make sure, though, that I bring up the right one for you. Um, okay. There we go. Sorry about that. So being as um, groceries are the second highest expense in our budget, kind of focusing on the groceries and different ways that we can save. Um, and also, so if we have participants that are dealing with, uh, that we work with, that are dealing with financial strain this is a great way to start a conversation that's not as difficult as it used to be. So everybody here on the news, even today, um, uh, grocery prices aren't going down. They probably won't go down. Um, and this is something that's here to stay. So it's a great way to start up a conversation um, with family, with friends, if we have participants at work that are trying to um, deal with these costs as well for looking for savings. So sometimes it's hard to talk about finances, but this is a good way to break into it. Um, so um, let's just see, there's different ways that we could ask, you know, how do you save money? I'm doing this, what do you do? And a lot of times I get really good information from my clients as well. So some of the things we've all come up with would be price matching using flyers or Flip or Reby is an app that you could use or Flash Food um, for foods that are drastically reduced. Um, so those are good ways to save money as well. If you don't wanna bring your flyers in using the app of Flip and Reby, um, you can use them on your phone. Um, or you can also just see what's the most expensive cost in what we're going to meal plan for the week. It's normally um, protein or meat, something like that. Uh, what store has the cheapest? We can use Flip or Reby for that and do our shopping there if we like. Uh, make a shopping list and sticking to it, meal planning, choosing frozen food instead of um, fresh to reduce cost. Check expiry dates. So those are important. A lot of the things that are in the um, bins where they're reduced prices, they have um, almost expired, but I mean, that's still fine if there are items that we would use and we can meal plan maybe for the next week or the following week we can with that um, we could also use curbside pickup for groceries so ordering them online it can save time but the other pieces you won't get as tempted um, at all the other items that are in the store when we're walking around the store um, and it's easier to stick to our needs as opposed to our, our wants those impulse uh, pieces uh, there's things like toy swaps. So Facebook communities um, also have um, free items. Uh, there's Gas Buddy app that uh, people list where the cheapest price for gas is in the area. Uh, one thing I always mention too is if anyone has children with the RESP, um, the Registered Education Saving Plan, maybe we don't have the funds to save um, in a savings plan right now, but I still encourage people to open it as soon as possible. So open the RESP at your bank or whatever financial institution you uh, choose to do so and also have them open the learning bond so you don't have to contribute anything at all to the RESP uh, but make sure the learning bond is opened it's not opened automatically all the time when you open an RESP um, but you could receive up to two thousand dollars in funds not even for the total um, time of the RESP, um, depending on age, without even contributing anything. So it's something that could be a savings for school. So starting that savings if we have children. So I always like to mention that um, because it's not always utilized. Um, so those are just some ways that we can have some savings. I do encourage people to talk about that. Um, and um, start that conversation and look at our spending and how could we save. Those could be some ways to do it. There are also things like if we're feeling, um, so I'm just bringing some up on the screen um, that are in, there's some saving strategies here for you too if you do want the slides. Um, um, let's see, okay. And um, different ways to stick to our budget, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we do have a, a question that I thought I'd bring forward for you. Of course. Of course. And, um, so yeah. uh, uh, Barb has posted, so many of our CAPC families struggle with child support issues. So having to pay or not receiving perhaps from a, an ex-partner um, 
uh, or how an ex-partner is spending money on perhaps there's another family, yeah. like step families, second families. Mm-hmm. So do you have a resource that maybe has a, um, addresses this as a topic? Is that, um, and some thoughts um on- well, if, if I'm, yeah, if I'm looking around finances, as far as how, when I get those, that kind of information from people where, you know, what is your income coming in? Um, and well, I'm supposed to get support, but don't always follow through. Likely, mm-hmm. normally I don't get it. I can't depend on it. It happens sporadically. Mm-hmm. So I can have that with clients. So if I'm looking at how do we budget around that, I, understanding, especially now it's really difficult. But when I look at budgets that kind of have fluctuating income, I would look at in that mm-hmm. respect mm-hmm. is Sometimes we do two budgets. Sometimes we do a base budget. Base budget really covers our fixed expenses, the things that absolutely have to get paid, Mm -hmm. like rent, hydro, utilities. Um, And then sometimes we're having to not get all of those things that we need that are more flexible, that there's not a bill coming for. Um, So maybe it is those shampoos, deodorants. I'm really, um, you know, short on those, but I have to try to make them last if we can, or I'm going into my non-monetary emergency saving or non-monetary food savings for that so Mm -hmm. sometimes those are ways that can compensate for it Um, just focusing on the things that we need for that month if we get the funds the following month okay great from my second budget I have for those other needed items but I just it's not feasible to get that one month Mm -hmm. we can then plan which items should I get next from that so in, in a perfect world, when I say for fluctuating income like that, um, it doesn't always work out this way, but if we can save a little bit from that, put that into a savings account that is basically um, for when we are short for what we're supposed to receive for income, mm-hmm. and then we could draw from that. But that, a lot of times we're in a difficult situation that we have to use whatever is coming yeah. in, so understanding that. And that's where I look at ways with, that we could um, compensate with that a non-monetary emergency food savings each time we go to the grocery store could I get one um, non-perishable food item if we use our food budget which again I don't recommend it but it happens Uh, Mm -hmm. so may as well address that so if I do use my food budget for whatever those items are that were needed that I didn't have enough income for I can pull from my um, non-monetary emergency savings basically I mean um, if if through the court system for that to make sure I got those funds Mm -hmm. I I mean I understand that's not guaranteed as well too because maybe Mm -hmm. they just stop working Mm -hmm. but yeah that that's a difficult one but how I address that would be uh, the only means I have is looking at the budget and uh, how can we make our at least our fixed expenses get paid for because renting right now we kind of have to stay where we are if we have especially if we have a good price um uh, apartment uh, for us to live in mm-hmm. the cost of living right now for renting is so expensive and they're mm-hmm. also checking our credit score so if our credit isn't good as well too that can definitely affect things so I know it's not a great solution mm-hmm. um, and hopefully you know we do get that support come in from time to time that we can be um, pulling from what we need have that list kind of like the financial goals okay these are my goals that when I do have that um, money come in then these are the key things that I need to get first Um, so kind of prioritizing those as well too thank you Um, yeah no worries so I know I don't have a lot of time but I just want to focus on some things so there Mm -hmm. are in the slides also if you do do wish to have them there are options as far as debts I'm not going to focus a whole lot on them um, Mm -hmm. but I'll just share uh, really quickly here on that so we also have I'll I'll go over them real quick so if we're able to pay Mm -hmm. debts down ourselves. Um, is the best way to do it as far as our um, credit rating and score goes. Some people, um, we need to know what our budget is first. We need to know what we can put towards those debts. Mm -hmm. Um, And if we're able to maintain at least minimum payments on those debts, um, where can we cut back maybe a little bit in our budget so we can put a little extra towards paying down those debts? Some people, I know visually what I find with most people is if we pay down the smallest one first, Visually, that gives us incentive to keep moving forward. So if we pay minimum payments on all of our regular debts, but our smallest debt, wherever we've cut back a bit to give us extra money, we put towards that smallest debt, 
once that's paid off, then we work on the next smallest debt. Um, I find that with most people are successful. We also hear the high interest repayment on debts where we're paying the one with the highest interest first, um, mm -hmm. which is great. It gives us a little bit of savings over time, but it's not as much as you might think. Um, so you do, you pay back the debt if it's feasible to do the best way you can, um, which works best for you. So that's knowing yourself and how you like to work. There are debt management programs where um, you're going through um, a credit counseling program to pay those down, but I find those aren't always the best option. Um, they're more expensive unless you have assets like a house or um, where you have a mortgage and those kind of things. We normally referred when we did that to a trustee for consumer proposals where you're settling the debt over a four to five year period of time, which puts more room in your budget. Uh, so if you're paying half of what all those minimum payments on your credit card is, uh, it might be more feasible to do that. Or there is um, bankruptcy uh, with a bankruptcy trustee. Or if we have equity in our home that we could use to pay off the debt, that can be an option as well. But I would say talk to a mortgage broker about that. I do have resources listed in, um, um, in the slides as well too. Uh, so there's list places that you can look for trustees um, and that uh, type of thing uh, for referrals if you need them. Or you could go through um, myself as well too and we could refer out that way. The last video I'm hoping if you have a, a chance to play is the automatic thoughts. Um, yeah. Um, and then we can finish up on that. Okay. Sure. All right. Okay, perfect. Let me get that going. Okay, thanks. Today, we're going to talk about ATs, also known as automatic thoughts. They're those destructive and um, unreasonably negative thoughts that you have that make things go from bad to worse. Avoiding ATs feels as impossible as avoiding red lights when you're running late. You're going to hit one or two, or every single light from your house to work on that morning that your report's due at 9 a.m. and your boss is already on the edge and you might just get fired and then get evicted and... See? Automatic thoughts can pop up and escalate as easy as that. Regardless of reality, ATs are the things that help you build a couple of red lights up to an Armageddon-scale catastrophe in a matter of seconds. Today on Wellcast, we're going to show you how to manage those harmful automatic thoughts with healthier, rational ones. And we're going to use our triple R exercise. You are going to record, rationalize, and replace your ATs. But first, how serious are ATs? A study at UCLA shows that people who got caught in cycles of automatic negative thinking became clinically depressed, self-critical, and less successful in both their work and personal lives. According to Dr. Glenn Scaraldi, these negative, disordered ATs fall into 13 categories, all of which take a toll on your mental health. Here are some of the categories. Assuming or mind reading. Like when you are sure someone is mad at you even though you haven't spoken to them just because they walked in and didn't say hi. Shoulds, must, and oughts. Those are the insane demands that we make upon ourselves in our quest to be impossibly imperfect. The fairy tale fantasy. Where we demand an ideal for our life and decide that anything less than that ideal just isn't fair. Overgeneralizing. Nobody likes me. I always ruin everything. And finally, catastrophizing. When you take a little problem and turn it into a big, terrible, life-changing event. How do we stop ATs? Good question. And the shorter answer is we don't. But... By being conscious of the fact that we're having them and working to replace them with rational thoughts, we can keep them from endangering our mental health. And that is today's exercise. All right, everybody, take out your Wellcast journal. It's time to learn the three R's. Step one, record an upsetting event. When something upsetting happens during the day, describe it in your Wellcast journal and record it in excruciating, painful detail. For example, Today I found out that I got a C on my midterm. Step two, rationalize. Now it's time to think about the automatic thoughts associated with the event. Pause and print this chart. In column one, write down each AT you had about the upsetting event. For example, I am never going to graduate. In the second column, try and label each distortion. 
Some ATs might be rational, but most won't be. They'll most often fall into one of the categories we discussed. I am never going to graduate. Falls into the category of catastrophizing. Step three, replace. In the third column, respond to each distorted AT. Talk back. Get those negative thoughts off your chest. And if it's hard to do that, try to imagine what you'd say to a friend who is struggling with their own AT and say it to yourself. When you're responding to those ATs, ask yourself some questions like, what's the evidence for this response? Is this a believable outcome for my situation? Will the world end if I get a C on this midterm? Of course not. So as time goes on and you're more used to responding to your ATs instead of letting them take over your life, you should be able to replace those ugly negative thoughts with more rational ones. Let's recap. To keep your automatic thoughts from ruining your mood and running rampant, you're going to record upsetting events, rationalize them by addressing each irrational thought, and replacing the irrational automatic thought with a rational one. The world is not going to end. Tweet us at WatchWellCast. Email us at WatchWellCast. I saw one of the comments come up similar to CBT and actually we do go through a little bit of CBT in our group as well too. So I thought I'd just share if you do have participants that um, you're finding are dealing with these things. We have a six week video group, no cost for it. So you don't even have to be within our region to attend it. Um, you can contact or they can contact our agency and they can register for it. And all of this information is kind of compressed into little bits today, but we take six weeks to thoroughly go through it. Um, so that's something that's always an option if you have anyone who's interested in that as well too. Just going from that automatic thought patterns, um, if we're relating it to finances, I just did a really quick one up where we're recording whatever the upsetting event was. Maybe it's I'll be in debt forever and people will think that I'm a failure. If we rationalize that, um, never going to pay this debt back ever um, is is that rational um, in our response you know what would you say I'm making this simple from what we talked about today what would you say to a friend that is struggling um, with their ATs is this actually a believable response you wouldn't say yeah you're going to be in debt forever there's nothing you can do and we're all going to think you're a failure no there are things you can do and I can help you with that right so um, or a financial counselor can help you with that so um, just kind of simple ending on that note with that emotional piece that plays so much um, into our finances. For quick resources, I thought a really simple resource, a very trusted resource that will help no matter what area in the province people are coming from is Canada.ca. So that's Canada Revenue Agency. Um, they are timely with their updates. If it's different in province to province, that will say on there, but really simple to search for things. So Canada.ca, how to budget, Canada.ca, um, uh, how to pay down my debts or looking for financial counselors. Um, there's also listed on here, if we're looking for um, a, a way to budget that links into our banking, mint.com. So that's a budget tracker planner here is um, a, um, free. It's been around forever. It is a really good resource and it's the most common one that I find people going back to. So we can link it into our um, accounts so it can track the spending. I have a lot of people who use avoidance and they just can't track because uh, looking at each person purchase is difficult. So having something that can pull that tracking piece out um, can be very helpful as well too. Um, so if you want the slides or the resources, please feel free um, to reach out for those. Sydney has them as well. Or if um, she can direct you to me, that is completely fine as well too. I don't know if we have time for questions still. I know you have another presenter um, on probably on deck already. So if, if there are questions that, um, Sydney, I don't know if you've seen any of them that would be um, Mm -hmm. pressing that you'd like me to address I can or if we run out of time I apologize and if it's something that you want to talk further on you can always um, contact connect with me absolutely thank you Krista um, um, oh sorry my, my brain just sort of broke a little bit there oh yes what I wanted to say was uh, we have had some requests for your slides so I can send them out with my wrap-up email today uh, so okay. they'll be there okay, with perfect. all your resources. And um, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the in the chat. Um, 
just some, you know, reflections on, on some of the things that, that you were saying. Uh, but if anybody does have a question, feel free to pop it in, in the chat in the next minute or two, um, as we are perhaps doing our giveaways. Um, uh, Krista, if you have a moment to, to stick around before we'll move into our closing with uh, with Sheila. And uh, as we're, there she is, Sheila. Um, so we have... Uh, three more $20 coffee cards to give away. Uh, so I would invite, uh, you know, uh, anybody who hasn't already won one to, to participate. And I have uh, three questions here. So Krista, if you'll help me, do you see the chat there? Do, do you are, um, help yeah. me um, find the, the first person to answer correctly? We'll let you be the, the, uh, the contest judge. And uh, in, in our uh, okay. here and then later um, before Sheila does the closing, we'll do one more Amazon gift card uh, giveaway with Sheila as we kick off the closing. So, um, oh, and I also wanted to say I did put a survey link in the chat as well. Uh, if you have a chance to share your thoughts on this last session, we we greatly appreciate it. Okay, so uh, first question was, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, uh, not Sheila, uh, Krista, <laughs> it's getting to the end of the conference, right? Uh, Krista talked about different kinds of focus. She talked about values focus versus what kind of focus. And I am seeing some correct answers coming up there. And uh, so Krista, we'll just give you a moment to see and um, find the first person who answered that correctly. I know it can be tricky as they all come in. Lots of people yeah. correctly guessing goals focus. And yeah, so and then I have Trudy with value and goals. Sorry, Trudy? Trudy? Yeah, she put value, yeah, value and goals, yeah. Okay, Trudy. And is that, uh, okay, Trudy, I've got you down for a coffee card. And uh, again, please uh, shoot me an email so that I, I have your contact information. Uh, so great. So let's go into the next one. Um, Krista, and this can be a, the closest estimate. Um, you did a calculation on the cost of uh, two coffees a day. And you came up with an amount for a yearly cost. And um, you just do math there real quick in the calculator. You know, uh, who can come closest to that a yearly spend on uh, two, two coffees a day? And there's a few people who have posted. <laughs> and uh, who, who is closest there, do you think? Yeah. So the first one who's close, okay, I have even closer one, okay. So Barb, let me just double check. Barb has 1,087, and when I just did it really close, it is 1,075.20. So the first one I saw that's the closest is Barb um, at 135 okay. p.m. I don't know if that helps you there. <laughs> yeah, Barb. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Barb. Uh, congratulations, another uh, $20 gift card. So we have one more. And then, um, uh, so this one uh, was just recently, as uh, the session was wrapping up, we had a little video on what are ATs? What are ATs? <laughs> yeah, the first one that came in was from T uh, Tina Neeb, Automatic Tina. Thoughts. Excellent. She was quick. <laughs> was quick. Thank you, Tina, and uh, congratulations to uh, Trudy, Barb, and Tina for um, winning uh, winning coffee cards this afternoon. Awesome! And again, just a quick reminder to please shoot me an email letting me know so that I have your contact information. And I think that wraps up our time with Krista. Thank you so much, Krista. I think I will stop recording now. <laughs>